But the HD Rumble, you can feel the baby inside the capsule. Oh, oh, oh we have to go. He's got to do this now. Oh, he's got to. No, you can't let insane people near new tech, man. This is just oh, no. This week on Backward Compatible. Bradley McAvoy James joins Jim, Doc, and Chris to share his advanced hands-on impressions of the Nintendo Switch. Plus, the crew responds to a listener letter about censorship on Twitch. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 91 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, guys. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And a returning guest today, uh, Bradley McAvoy-James. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm back with a longer, stupider name. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Actually, you were uh, you were married last time we had you on, too, but we forgot to uh, use that name, so. Ah, uh, yes. I remember now. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, yeah. I still I still get it all the time. People go, your name's really stupid. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> uh, well, belatedly, uh, many uh, congratulations. Uh, He's no, a gamer who got married. Let's. Uh... <laughs> this is this is big news. I know. Is, there, there's hope for us yet. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so yeah, we have Bradley on today because uh, he got a chance to go out to the um, the big uh, hands-on event for the Nintendo Switch, uh, which happened the day after that big uh, stream they did. Um, you went to the one that happened in the UK. Uh, yeah, naturally, and uh, got some hands-on impressions. We're going to use that as a chance to sort of talk about what you uh, what you saw, what you thought of it, and also we're going to um, lead that into a discussion about uh, what the Switch might be able to do in terms of game design. Things. Everything. <laughs> well, we're going to go ahead and start off with some of our usual opening segments, and this time we're going to start with Table Talk. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. So I haven't been doing a lot of video gaming lately, but the uh, what we have been doing is a lot of tabletop gaming. That's uh, true. So I've been running a game of Fellowship uh, for Doc and a couple other friends. And that's powered by the Apocalypse. If you've <laughs> not heard of this one, it's worth looking into, especially if you're into that... Can I call it a system? Can I call Powered by the Apocalypse a system? I'd say so, yeah. Okay. And what's kind of cool about Fellowship is that um, it's based loosely on stories along the lines of Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is very clearly a big influence on Huge it. inspiration. Um, but it's not the only inspiration for it. Oh, very true. Um, but basically you've got a, a party of players known as the Fellowship that's trying to defeat the Overlord. Um, and the flavor of that exactly is actually defined by the players as you play. So the Overlord's in charge of talking about what they're all about, but the players each represent basically their race. And so you've got a play set, for example, for the dwarves, but the dwarves might come in a whole bunch of different forms in your particular game. So uh, the player who plays the dwarf gets to define the dwarven culture in that world. Yeah, they might be born of rock, or they might be short little men, they might be hairy, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, they might be drinkers, they might not. Mm -hmm. It's, there's lots of opportunities. We don't actually have a dwarf in our party. No, we don't. Uh, which is kind of interesting. One of the amazing things about this is you know you're going to win. We, we the party, mm -hmm. know that we're going to win. That's, that's stated right up front mm -hmm. in the beginning. Um, it's just a matter of how. And my job is to make it as difficult as possible along the way. Yeah, so. to, to throw um, roadblocks. Mm -hmm. And boy, have you done that. Uh, <laughs> the betrayal comes to mind, Chris, mm -hmm. which um, narratively was brilliant, but actually it was a mechanic mm -hmm. from the very beginning. So explain to us exactly how that... So when you're building the Overlord, the Overlord is a character just like all the player characters. And when Powered by the Apocalypse, a lot of games have you uh, basically go almost through a worksheet and select different things to sort of select what your mechanics are, what your play style is going to be, mm -hmm. to define certain things about your character. And one of the things that I could do as the Overlord is pick kind of like what they call um, your defensive abilities or something like that. And... Um, one of the options was actually a traitor, uh, and it sort of describes, like, you know, you pick one character outside of the Fellowship who is going to, uh, at some point reveal themselves to be working for the Overlord and cause trouble for the, uh, for the party. Yeah, so you chose the manservant. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Well, the, the, yeah. More, more like the counselor, the sage. He, yeah, he was. But, he was, he was um, educated. Our, our heir, who is uh, being played by our friend Kevin, who's actually the GM for an upcoming season of Roll With It that uh -huh, we're hoping to yeah. release soon, um, uh, he is kind of... He's in a lot of ways the protagonist. He's kind of the central character, and the other, the rest of the party is kind of like around his Very quest. Much so, yeah. 
Um, but he actually defined as one of his companions, and I might have broken the rules just a little bit because companions, I think, are technically considered part of the fellowship, in which case I shouldn't have been able to do this, but you guys didn't care. Yeah, it's better no, for the you, story. If, if you can't break the rules while role playing, why role play? Right? Exactly. And so I decided very early on that I was going to make this guy the traitor. And it was all a lie. <laughs> it was all a lie. We uh, were tricked. So the he had an ability actually on his sheet that said one of the things that he possessed at the beginning of the game was a map. Um, that was revealing the source of or a source of power, which is a pretty important thing mechanically to beating the Overlord in the long run. Um, yeah, and the o- magic tech. The, the Overlord <laughs> wants it. And so um, he was basically sent on this mission, and it was kind of, he resented it because it was going against his duty to protect the wall. And it, it, I'm not going to go into the backstory of the world. Short version is that he thought that he was on a mission from his father, the king. Turns out that he was actually just be, sort of being led along by his advisor. Because Kruger's a dirty liar. <laughs> we, uh, but I, I basically, I didn't, I didn't, um, I sort of implanted hints about like what might be happening. And so when it actually did happen, it all made sense. Yeah, like you guys, you guys it saw totally that did. the one who had the map was this guy. The guy who was insisting that our mission was to go and do this thing was this guy. And on and on. Um, so as a, as a player, like kind of how did. Because uh, as the GM, like I, I knew this all going into it, so it's a very different experience, I think, knowing that versus actually experiencing. Yeah, the well, you know, um, it, it's weird, and I can't believe I'm about to say this, but mm-hmm. the fact that it was a mechanical thing that you had planned from the very beginning. Whenever you said, "I want you guys to see this on my sheet to mm-hmm. show that I didn't just decide to do this. This is something I had planned from the beginning." Mm-hmm. It made it more impactful. Mm-hmm. Um, just for some reason, having that narrative element down there as a thing that was going to happen as a course of it um, within the context of the mechanics of the game mm-hmm. really fused that uh, ludonarrative element together uh, so that it prevented ludonarrative dissonance. Mm-hmm. There's our splash of academia for the day. <laughs> um, and to me, it was the most powerful moment. Okay, well, second most powerful moment of the entire campaign. The first was when I got to burn down the inn. To, to All right. Guys <laughs> but, uh, May cause a distraction. Yeah, so um, <laughs> the, the moral of the whole story is, um, you know, if, if you're not able to uh, warn your party that uh, they're being ambushed, burn down the inn. There you go. That's <laughs> Burn cool. down the inn, okay. Burn down the inn, yeah. Were people still in the inn as you burned it yeah, down? Yeah, totally. Okay. Yeah, that was... Yeah, don't take they... that as a life hack, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they that's not a life hack. It's not fire. like, oh, right. things might happen, burn a house down. Like, oh, jeez. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But, you, you, uh, you, you flushed them out of the inn and right into the, the waiting arms of the people who were burning down the entire town. Correct. That yes. Is, and, and then they fought and killed them all, see? So it all worked out well. But uh, Fellowship, it's a, it's a great little game. Um, mm-hmm. Powered by the Apocalypse, check it out. This is Inbox, where the crew responds to listener questions, comments, and letters to the editor. To join the discussion, email inbox at backward-compatible.com. As you will recall, we have an email, and people do send us emails. Uh, This is sent to us by James H., and he wants to tell us about a game now, uh, called Yandare Simulator. Now, I had not heard of this game before. Um, I hadn't even heard of a Yandare, but uh, I got my education this week. And James writes, Have you heard of a game currently in development called Yandare Simulator? In summary, it is a game where you play as a high school girl with a crush on another student and decide to eliminate any other girls that he or she might fall in love with through various methods such as violence, expulsion from school, social sabotage, matchmaking with another student, etc. Some time ago, Twitch had added the game to a list of banned games that shouldn't be played during streams. And... Yandare Dev, the developer of the game, has tried to communicate as to why it was banned, but Twitch has been completely unresponsive and opaque on the issue. And um, I happened to, uh, to you know, look it through, and, and, and James actually sent us some stuff, and uh, there's actually a video, uh, more, mo- most recently, about his whole experience, if you will, uh, with trying to figure out from Twitch why it was banned. But and um, I, think, I think one thing that I think is important to mention for this mm-hmm. is that this is not a released game. Well, that's true. This it's, game is in development. It was banned been before, under before yeah. it even came out. That's a good point. Which is different from the other games. There's t- 29 games that Twitch has banned. Mm-hmm. And all those other games have actually been released. Oh, wow. This is the only game that actually they preemptively banned it. Mm-hmm. That's which amazing. I find also interesting. Yeah, which it is. gets into another discussion about the gray area of like pre-release games and whether or not those can be considered released right. or unreleased, that sort of thing. Well, so... 
Uh, you may ask why why James sent this to us, and, and he says that he wanted to help spread news of the situation so that he may get more support and attention, but would also like to know what your opinions are on how companies like Twitch could unfairly judge and restrict games and content and not give acceptable reasons as to why. How can other game developers, video streamers, and uploaders, and fans help to protect victims such as Yandare Dev? And so, um, as one would expect with an editorial, mm -hmm. uh, there's a little bit of uh, a, a bias in the email itself, uh, simply to look at him as a victim. My first question to you guys is, is Yandari Dev a victim? Well, sure. I mean, any of these games, even games that you could say, let's say even a game that is potentially banned for a specific reason that might match their policies, mm -hmm. um, in this case, he was never given, or the devs were never given a reason why it was banned. So I think that any time you're being punished for something without knowing why you're being punished, um, that to me immediately is unfair. Okay, so there's some fairness um, I, bells. That I think you have to be. There are a couple things that are, that are going on here. One, your policies need to be upfront. Mm -hmm. You can't just a after the fact say we're going to ban you for this reason. Um, their 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 policies aren't upfront. They mm -hmm. should know in advance. The the devs behind Yandare Simulator should know. Here, okay. here are bannable. Here, like a list of bannable yes. content. And, and also go look at it and go. Or if it's not even just the content, maybe it's how much how prevalent it is. Mm -hmm. But let's say they knew that in, in advance. They could look at it and go, oh, okay. Well, according to these policies, we're not going to be able to be on Twitch. But we understand that because we've read their policies. Mm -hmm. Um, but they don't, they don't have that. They do not publish a set of things that they say these are the definite rules for what is banned and what is not. The second problem is that they not only do they not have that, they also didn't even bother to tell them why they were banned after they were banned, mm -hmm. despite them consistently contacting and saying, hey, uh, why are we banned? You, you, should, you should have a comeback for that. You should be able to say, oh, okay, here's why you're banned. Here are the reasons. Um, sorry, but this is our policy, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. That never happened either. And so that, to me, makes this whole thing seem very shady because there's actually various other games that are not banned from Twitch. I mean, like I said, before, I mentioned briefly, there's only 29 games banned from Twitch. Mm -hmm. That's not and, a big list. And, there are, and yes, um, a lot of those games are either uh, graphic sex games or graphic violence. But there's lots of other games that are also very violent and also have sex, sexual content, including some graphic sexual content, mm -hmm. that are not banned. In fact, if you scan the list, about half the list has graphic sex in the title. Sure. I mean, it's, it's sure. actually, you know, graphic... But, but there are other games that also have, sex, have, have uh, um, sexual content, including a variety of visual novels that include sexual content oh, sure. that are not banned, is my point. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm just saying that it doesn't seem like there's a hard and fast rule from Twitch... I, I think, to be that honest with you, to me, I do think that there is some sort of um, slight cultural bias here hmm. against um, games from, like, you know, like Japanese cultural-based games. Really? Because I was scanning through the list, and I, I noticed quite a lot of the games that are banned um, are games that are essentially, like, have a, a either they're, they're based, they're, they're made in Japan... Um, or they have a very strong influence from like Japanese anime. Okay, yeah, I, I don't know if there's any truth to that. It seems to be a thing. And, no, there is. A, there is. There is true. I mean, I, I perused the list myself, and a lot of it is essentially just uh, hentai games. Really, they're just games which want to show off naked women in some way. It's why a uh, Hoonie Pop was banned. Hoonie Pop was a a really a popular game because it basically can combine like uh, Candy Crush and seeing pictures of naked anime girls. <laughs> So you can imagine why it was popular. Right. Um, but what makes the case of Yandere Simulator even more interesting to me is the fact that how popular it initially was. When it was released um, a couple of years back, a lot of popular YouTubers, we're talking like the PewDiePies, the Markipliers, all the big YouTubers jumped on it. Because it was exactly their sort of game. It was clickbaity. It had <laughs> yeah. gratuitous violence for no reason. And, you know, it, it could create a lot of interesting situations. And they all jumped on it and they made videos about it. And the game got like, a ton of support, like a yeah. ton and, of support. And, in a short and to be clear, time. these are like these are early sort of test builds that were released. Um, yeah, for these the these were right. just like sandbox mode. You know, you could you go in and do what you want. I think the whole game currently is in just a sandbox mode. Right. Um, but you know, when I mean, I think the fact that those YouTubers jumped on it in the first place is kind of a sign that Twitch probably would have would ban it anyway because i mean the game is marketed as a as a stealth action video game mm. that's specifically what it says on it it's a stealth action video game but the goal is to kill that is that is the thing when the game is released um i've got the uh, spec here the, the game the point of the game is that it's set over 10 weeks and you your character is in love with uh, a character you refer to as senpai 
and over 10 weeks various other characters in your school will fall in love with senpai and then your job is within that week when that character falls in love with senpai is to remove them from the situation and these can be done by uh, blackmailing someone which inevitably ends up in them killing themselves or killing them in some way mm-hmm. um so you it, the emphasis is to kill in very uh how do i almost believable well manners. yes but i mean all of the hitman series you could say is also all about killing and also in believable ways and none of those are banned that's right i think, exactly, I think what yeah. differentiates this game um is that connection to japanese culture and also that this takes place um in a high school correct yes it does yeah so every, i think every level's in a school yeah. i think that's a part of it is that it takes place with um supposedly underage um or like just at the cusp of being of age yeah. people so therefore it's supposed to be extra bad even though if you I actually look through the um some of the images from the game and none mm-hmm. of them look like they're high school kids but well <laughs> but the the dev himself that's anime for you uh, yandari dev himself has come forward in mm-hmm. his video in his dialogue video um uh, and said listen uh, there are other games that are not on the list that have school violence. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's, yes, there are. Yeah, That's he he, thing, he yes. went through and he listed off, like, it was my game banned because it had X. Well, there's another game that has X. Right. Uh, that's so not clearly banned. not. Uh, it was my game banned because it had Y. Well, there's another game that has Y. You know, And he, he sort of went through this long list of things. Right. But the point that you made, Doc, that I thought was interesting was that his game had all of these things. Yeah, and I think that's really what it comes down to. I think it's not A plus B plus C plus D equals banned. I think it's A times B times C times D, that there's a magnifying effect that occurs whenever you have uh you know teenage nudity with uh school violence with whatever 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 well, it, to be to be clear is there actually is this a, this is not actually a sex game though correct that's right in fact no, there's no. actually no nudity in okay. it okay that's what i, I wanted to, i wanted to be from clear from his video because the, the is only things that right. um, are, in, are questionable is there is a character in the game called info chan because of course there is, and and to get info from Info Chan, who can provide like weapons or information about characters to blackmail them, you have to give them panty shots of your main character. Right. And ah. at the start of every day, you can equip your female character with a set of underwear that boosts a certain right. aspect of her, and you have to choose that, and it shows it on her. And then you have to take pictures of girls panty shots. So there's an element of creeping about there as well. And you can give him your own. So there's it's a bit. And then obviously the question is again, they're at school, so there's a question of age. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. the game doesn't exactly clarify how old they are, but Japanese schoolgirls range from ages of, to wear these specific uh, uniforms, like the sailor almost ones, range from 12 all the way up to 18. Mm-hmm. So, but there's the, a the visuals area to, that's there as well. The, definitely the visuals that I saw of the game, and I just looking through them, flipping through them, um, none of them look like they're actual children. No, 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 no. They all, they're, they're they all are, uh, we shall say, well-proportioned. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so as, as anime girls tend to be. So they're in that kind of like magical age where they're somehow anime schoolgirls, but they also look like they're supermodels. <laughs> yeah. So i got to ask this question. Doesn't Twitch have the right to make any list it wants, any criteria it wants, it's a private company. Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't it have the right to basically say, uh, we're going to ban all games with blue hair? Sure, as long as they actually um, consistently and um, fairly apply that rule. Yeah, and that's and kind of where I fall on it. They don't have, they don't have that. They don't, they don't even publish that. Mm-hmm. Let alone, are they doing it consistently? And, and from what we've seen, if you can run down a list and say, well, other games have this that are not banned, and I know your point about, well, this one combines a lot of those elements. Sure, but a lot of games combine a lot of different That's elements of, of graphic content. So they need to be upfront about what their rules are mm-hmm. and what games can and cannot be banned so that no one can feel like they are being singled out and victimized. Mm-hmm. And another point I did want to raise, too, um, is that when I was looking at the game's origins, um, this game was, uh, Yandere Simulator was originally pitched on 4chan, um, by the developers. Okay. So they actually were, they went to 4chan and they were like, hey, I have this idea for a game. <laughs> they, got, they got extra information. Yeah, they got extra information from 4chan. And so I think it is possible that that's a part of why the game was banned too. That makes because sense. Because it has this, like 4chan, just, just by virtue of its, um, I guess you could call it, I'm um, sorry, what's, oh, inf- there you go, infamy is probably a good term. Mm-hmm. But just in, in regards to its infamy that it, that it has gained, anything, anytime someone hears 4chan, a lot of times they think, um, in, very negative terms. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it's I think all these things kind of combined in order to get them banned. 
And that's not really a fair reason to go, well, this is associated with this website, therefore we should ban it. That's not really a reason. Same thing with Japanese culture. So I do think that there's some bias here. We can't prove it because we don't have a list. I think that's the point. I think Twitch wants to have... They basically want to have all the ability to control their, their site content without being upfront about why. They want to just basically arbitrarily ban a game or not ban a game. That's my thought. Okay. And then, and then I could see, too, like if they do have an open policy about why it is, if they suddenly decide that, like, oh, this thing just came out and we definitely need to ban it, but we can't because it's not on our list of bannable right. offenses. But why do they definitely need to ban it? No, I'm just I'm just throwing out. That doesn't make any sense. If it's well, not on their list, why would they definitely need to ban it? Well, because maybe, somebody thought of a new perversion, Jim. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm just throwing out a hypothetical. But the, that's not possible, by the way. <laughs> that's probably true. <laughs> I think there's also an element too of uh, I don't I don't know that, and I'm not familiar with Twitch, so maybe correct me if I'm wrong here. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that they have people who go around and they monitor the sort of stuff that's on Twitch and say like, oh, this is problematic. We should ban this. I think it's more probably based on user reports. It's users, yeah. And so probably what's happening is that, like, yes, there are a lot of other games out there that have these elements, but they're being played by streamers maybe who don't have much, you know, notoriety, Mm -hmm. um, or they don't have big enough audiences. Because, like, the bigger the audience, the higher the chance that someone's going to be offended and want to report something. Right, exactly. But but here's the thing, though. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're you're on a Twitch stream, and someone is streaming a game, and you find it offensive. Why don't you just... Turn it off. Turn it off or yeah. go to a different channel. Like, yeah. what, what's wrong too, with these yeah. people? It's not, that's not even an argument. Mm-hmm. That's just Think common sense. Think of the sense. children. Think of the children. Well, <laughs> the children shouldn't have been watching it either. Yeah, but exactly. It's like if you're sitting there and you're watching something and you don't like it and you're freaking out about it, then just turn it off. Mm. All no right. one's forcing you to sit there and gluing your eyelids open. So I want to close this with a conspiracy theory. Mm. Okay? Oh, this I is, love those. This is Doc's <laughs> conspiracy theory. It's, it's the grays. Remember the name of the guy... Who is making this? We don't know his real name. We could we could hunt it up, but what's he go by? Yandari Dev. Yandari Dev. We're talking about a dev who is himself Yandari. And having just learned what that means, <laughs> I now know it seems like a nice guy who's your friend, oh. and then without any meaning whatsoever, pops off for an insane thing and just goes kill a rabbit, right? Sure. That's totally it. That's what this is. The whole thing was constructed to get him banned so that he could freak out about it and drum up more business for his game once it releases. It says no such thing as bad publicity. Exactly. Or it could just be a random guy called Alex living in California. Yeah, yeah but nobody buys games <laughs> from a guy named Alex living in California. Um, Yandare Dev. No, you I can't understand why someone truth. making this game might want to remain anonymous. Uh, we don't really know what his... A job. He, he probably has another job, and mm-hmm. so we don't know what that is. And so it's possible that he might feel his employer might uh, look oh, that's very poorly sweet, at yeah. him, or, or his sweet. family or friends, or his or family or things. friends. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's so sweet. They may not have understanding friends in their life. Listen, whether or not he constructed this <laughs> or not, he's definitely riding the publicity wave. Sure. Well, and why I think, wouldn't you? I think the outrage is at least partially feigned. I really do. I, I don't think you can make a game like that and then expect it to be well received. I, th- I just don't. I think you're you're naive if you're doing that. So I, I really do think that there's an element of I'm going to see how risque I can be, get pegged to the wall, and then go see, see, look at but, me, victim. But this game victim. isn't anywhere near as risque as you can be, though. Well, not even close. Then uh, there's not e- there's not even graphic sexual content or people being like you know limbs being ripped off and splayed but everywhere. But see, we'd and- understand why that was being banned, maybe. So well, maybe, that's, maybe that's this is a point beautifully of calculated uh, and, and precise attempt at saying, well, why is it banned? It, it's almost like he went and took a survey of stuff that wasn't banned, created a game with all that stuff, and got it banned, and then it's now like, so you, why so are you, you banning my game? You think this is a social experiment? To I do. I think it's a grand done. social experiment. I don't think so because the amount of effort that it takes into um, developing a game – Oh, please, just, I've developed games yeah, before. It, <laughs> in an afternoon. Yeah, the, actual, the, the work that goes into it, you're not going to do that just for a social experiment. Sorry. Yeah. Um, just, but, um, no, I, I think, though, the, the, the core, and we've kind of touched yeah. on this already, but I think the ultimately, when it just comes to censorship in general, Twitch, being a private platform, has the right to ban whatever they want. But I do think there needs to be a certain level, like you said, Jim, of transparency and an appeals process that makes yeah. sense. No, no, no there, there has to be. Yeah. You, you can't just arbitrarily ban things. You cannot do that. Well, ultimately, it. though, this is America, and if people decide that that's a reason to stop using Twitch, they're going to move to another platform. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and this this being America, censorship is something that we should all oppose. 
Uh, I'm going to censor that out of this podcast. <laughs> um, Jim, uh, Jim just I'm said the one a thing. editing, and I'm, I'm not present or sure. Oh, so. man. Sorry, Doc. Oh. Thank you, James H., for your question. Hopefully, we, uh, we answered it. Um, and if you want to uh, write back again at some point in uh, response, maybe we didn't quite answer your question, uh, do for footer let us know. Uh, but yeah, we, we appreciate you uh, writing into Inbox. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. A game I recently been playing is a game called Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links. Uh, it rec- I think it's been out for a little bit in America, I think it's about two weeks, but it came out a week, uh, a week ago for European countries. Um, but it, what it is, is um, some context here. I- I've played Yu-Gi-Oh! since it came out, and I gave up uh, about two years ago just because of financial reasons and just, you know, I didn't really have access to it a place to play uh, but I've always had uh, held the game a little special in my heart it's always been I've always liked the anime and stuff like that um, so I gave it a download to see and what the game is is it's like if they took you go and chopped away like everything like extra about it so they've taken away a ton of the card pool it's been reduced from I think over like 9,000 cards to like just around 700 um, it's simplified the rules it's taken a couple of stages of the game out it's lowered the spare amount of monsters you'll have in the field like the amount of spells you're allowed to use lowered the life points lower the deck amount of so the amount of cards you're allowed to have in your deck um it's 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 kind of just stripped the game down to like a, 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 a format that they've called speed dueling hmm. um and while that may sound really poor or really boring it in fact has kind of given the game a new sense of life. It's been incredibly popular. I believe as time of this recording, it's probably about, I think, 21, no, 21 million downloads, oh, I wow. think. Or something crazy like that. Because um, they keep doing like promotion rules every million. They're like, oh, another another million downloaded and playing the game. Mm-hmm. Um, it's- and having now played it, it's so fun. It's so fun. Is this game... What is the cost of this game? It's completely free to download. Um, but so you, obviously, with any card game, you have to buy packs okay. to get cards. Okay. okay. Do you have to buy packs? I mean, is that the only? No, way? no, no. You, I'm thinking the way like to buy packs stone. is gems, and oh. the, to get gems, you can get them as drops from fighting NPCs, okay, or playing the online, which I'll talk about in a second, or you can buy, uh, spend money to get a certain amount of gems, which will then buy you packs. Okay, cool. So you can play this game a little slower, but completely free. Yeah, yeah, sure, wow. definitely. I love it. Cards also drop off uh, the 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 player characters. So like Yugi, Kaiba, all the famous ones, you can unlock them and play as them yourself. And when you play as them and level them up, they drop cards and gems, which you can then use and then use those gems to buy more card packs. And And the card packs actually work on a box system. So it will say this box, so there's a pack called Ultimate Rising. In this box, there's 200 packs. And beneath it, they'll have a, a, a big diagram of every single card that is available in that pack in every form of rarity and the amount of them hmm. so I'll show you every single card in that box so anytime if you for example say to open 100 packs of that box and you get every ultra rare card in that box mm-hmm. you can reset the box and get a new box with another 200 packs to then when you buy more packs you have a chance of getting those ultra rare cards again so it, it's it all feels like almost like you would really do in, in real life, like you would keep buying packs until you got the secret rare card out of the box and went, oh, well, I won't need anything else from that box, so I'll buy from another box. <laughs> so they do that sort of system, which I really, really enjoy. I think it's a really cool way of doing it. So it almost makes their um, pay model a bit more clear. You can even tick button, uh, tick uh, options that says, you know, me- instantly redo the box when you get all ultra rares or secret rares. or So it does it for you even, which <laughs> is great. Um so it, it's 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 back to the purest form of Yu-Gi-Oh! And I generally went in and thought, wow, this is really going to be boring. Like, I'm not going to enjoy this because I've, obviously I played Yu-Gi-Oh! at incredibly high levels. I mean, I I came quite high up in the European Championship the couple of times I went when I was playing it all the time. So I thought I'd be bored. But in fact, if anything, I'm I'm super loving it, Like, I, which is really surprising. Um, it's been made almost user-friendly. They've, they've, they've chipped away everything that would have made newcomers to the series feel, like, scared. Because you mean, Yu-Gi-Oh! is infamous now for having, like, text boxes on their cards, which you have to use a magnifying glass to read, because there's just <laughs> so much text written there, and there's so many rules. But they've, they've chopped that all away, and they've made something that I feel is actually really inoffensive and just really fun. Um, but that, that would all be fine. But the fact that the quality is so high as well, like, mm. they got the original voice actors of the series to come back and voice act lines specifically for this game. Well, that's pretty cool. So you actually, so when you're playing Yugi and you play a card that he plays, he will actually say 
the card's name. Hmm. So he'll be like, I summon Dark Magician. And then the anima- a cinematic will play. And you, uh, Joey will be like, I play my baby dragon and things like that. Like cards they've actually played in the show, which is absolutely great. And you can taunt with them as well. Like uh, if you tap the, the picture, you can get them to say famous lines uh, in the show, which is fantastic. Oh, we- <laughs> So you, would you say then that this is a uh, a good entry point for someone who says never played Yu-Gi-Oh before, never seen the the anime, like me, like me? Oh yeah, yeah. I think if if you like a sort of uh, uh, if you like the idea of playing a card game which isn't Hearthstone, which has really kind of dominated that market since it came out, mm-hmm. um, and you want to play it because Yu-Gi-Oh is massively popular. Like we're we're talking, it's now probably on par, or perhaps maybe I'd say more recognizable as a brand than Magic: The Gathering in terms of card games. Mm. Um, I feel like if you're even remotely interested, I just want to have a cool phone game. I was just just checking out. The quality of it is is astounding. It looks good. It plays good. It sounds good. The, I've caught myself humming some of the battle themes because they're so catchy and so energetic and enjoyable. And I don't know. I'm I'm just so impressed with it. I'm I really am, and I'd never expected to be. And now this week's meaty topic of discussion. All right, so like we said at the beginning of the show, Media Talk today is going to be uh, all about the Switch. Woo. And uh, I know we talked a little bit about it on our last episode, talking about the most anticipated games of 2017. Um, we talked about that that presentation they did and some of the features of the Switch. So mm-hmm. if uh, you want to go back and listen to that, we definitely recommend that. But uh, I, for one, am very excited about uh, the Switch coming out. So Bradley, can you tell us a little bit about um, what your impressions were uh, from that event? I'd be happy to. Um, so just for some context here, I... Uh, as a request of my university I work with for, which is Staffish University, they asked me to try and get some information on the Switch for them uh, because we, as a university, are paired with uh, Unreal and Epic. Oh, cool. Because we use the Unreal Engine predominantly here uh, to make our games. And obviously they announced them they're working on titles and with Nintendo, which is a, which is some cool news. So they wanted me to go down to London and check it out. So I um, entered into the event and I actually got my tickets. I took me and my wife... Took a nice little trip down to the Hammersmith Apollo to go and have a check out of it. Um, it was really fun. Um, we got in. The first game I picked up was Arms, and I kind of then went around and played all the games uh, it, it, you know, as much as I could. I think I, I did manage to play everything there, bar I think like one or two third-party developer mm-hmm. games because the queues for them got got quite ridiculous at some points. Yeah, like a so Sonic jealous. Mania, for example. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. That how, one was... how was Arms, by the way? Because I saw that one. It seemed like a very different game. Do you know what's hilarious about Arms? Mm. It's it's one of those things where when you read it on paper, you think, oh my god, that sounds terrible. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but then when you play it, suddenly there's a lot of charm there that you didn't, that, that wouldn't translate from a piece of paper. Like, so think about it, right? You say to someone, oh, what's arms? Oh, it's a game where you use motion controls to uh, fake punch someone in the hope that uh, they will dodge and then you've got to, you know, do different like movement combinations with your hands in order to block and to move. And already, you know, I can feel people listening going like, oh, you know what I mean? Because they've been burned <laughs> by poor motion controls before. But ARMS has a lot of nuance to it, which I didn't initially expect. So I picked a character that's known to be quite, you know, like light on his feet. And you can choose different fists to put on the end of your arms. So you've got like a, a, a boomerang arm, which you can sort of bend in mid-flight by bending the controller and a, and a multi-hitting um, a fist which throws out three shots which I can sort of manipulate and there's, there's jumping, there's blocking, there's grabbing which is there's a trifecta there so block beats punches, punches beats grabs and grabs beat blocks, you know that sort of thing mm. so it's it's got everything there and when you play it it's just kind of fun like the, the Joy-Con um, motion controls put the Wiimote and the Wiimote Plus to absolute shame they're so responsive and so accurate, it's, it's crazy so much so I accidentally by pure by pure accident, when I was in the demo, I accidentally calibrated them wrong. And, and usually when you calibrate something wrong, you can kind of bring it back mm. by sort of realizing where the calibration is. But I just couldn't because they're that precise. They needed to be precisely calibrated, like exactly. Up, and it just ruined the whole experience for me when I started off. And then when I calibrate them like perfectly the next time, it completely changed it. And it actually became, I actually walked away thinking that could be an eSport. That's how shocked i was i was like wow i could see my fighting game friends being like that is awesome i want to see that in fact at evo this year they're actually uh it's one of the games that the community can vote in to be played at evo huh. uh, which is the big fighting game tournament that happens every year it's one of the i think they've chosen 10 games and now people fans can, can vote in and the most one of the most votes uh gets to be played on the big stage at evo which is which is crazy that it's even being considered for that mm-hmm. um 
it's just it's just awesome. I really can't describe it. It's it's one of those games you're really going to have to sort of... I think this is going to be a consistent thing, by the way. <laughs> it's one of those games you're going to have to play, really, to get your own opinion of it. And I think that's kind of the big, Switch's biggest issue when it comes mm-hmm. to games, is that I ha- I'm a big Nintendo fan. Mm-hmm. And I went down there with doubts, like serious doubts and concerns. But I got in and I played it, and I played the games, and I held it in my hands, and I left and went... I'm gonna buy that. That's cool. So, so what other games did you play while you were there? Did, did they have okay. Zelda? Yeah, they did. Yes, um, I played Zelda: Breath of the Wild, uh, hey. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, well, Splatoon 2. Let, let's Arms. let's back it. Let's back it up, though. What do you think of uh, Breath of the Wild? Because I'm really, <laughs> I'm really. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna game. say like that's that's the consistent question I've been asked. So I I batted my eyelids very nicely and may have sort of flirted with a couple of uh, Nintendo employees there <laughs> because the lines for Zelda were huge like mm-hmm. we're talking i got in there and th- i went straight to zelda uh after sort of my wife went off in a different direction oh so that's um, that's why and- you were able to do the flirting <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah pretty much uh, and uh, i went over to the line i said how long is it for zelda she went the line's three hours oh wow and i was like even that's that's crazy that's genuinely crazy so I've, I've batted my eyelids a little bit and i managed to get in i queued for about an hour and a half um and i managed they, they were limiting people to 15 minute games but I, I kept sort of like egging on my guy who was supposed to take me on, and I ended up playing for about forty-five minutes. Oh, <laughs> nice. Um, so Breath of the Wild is—it's going to be. I, I've, first of all, it's, it looks gorgeous mm. visually yeah. speaking. Yeah, it does. It's got a wonderful aesthetic. It the world itself looks like vast and and big and event, full of adventure. Just it feels like there's something around every corner, and it's a really wonderful feeling. And that's kind of helped by Link's ability to climb everything. Um, the mm. climbing mechanic has added a lot of explorative factors to it. Like, literally, you know, how do I escape this fight? Originally, it's just run away. Now I could run and jump up this, climb up this wall. And, 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 you know, for example, I left the starting area and the guy was like, oh, you know, there's a temple over there. Maybe you could check it out. So I climbed to the top of the temple and the guy went, oh, you can't climb much higher. And I was like, really? Can't climb any higher? Then I climbed higher. And he went, Wow. I don't know you climb well, you could probably climb back down. I went, no, no, I think I can climb higher. And I climbed higher and higher and higher until I was literally hanging off the top of the spire of the temple, like Assassin's Creed style. Oh, wow. <laughs> and the guy was like look and, and the guy was looking at me going, like, I didn't even know you could climb that high. And this guy's been like watching people play this game for like three days now. Mm-hmm. Huh. And then as I got to the top of it, it did like an Assassin's Creed sort of spin round, you know, when you're accessing a point. Mm-hmm. And it came back to me and a Duca scrub appeared and he gave me an item which the guy had never seen, and that unlocked a chest. So I jumped down, uh, climbed, so I climbed back down, opened the chest, I got bomb arrows. Oh, cool. And the guy kind of went, I've been playing this game for like three days with people. I have never seen anyone unlock bomb arrows. <laughs> nice, nice. And I was like, so this, this guy's been playing this game himself because all of the people there had played it for like hours when you know, there, there was downtime. And he'd been watching hundreds of people play it. He watched like other journalists play it. He watched hundreds of players play it. And not one of them had found bomb arrows. I mean, if that doesn't say something about this game's explorative qualities, I don't know what does. I, mean, I, I literally just went, this is just awesome. Mm-hmm. You know, the, it, the, the analogy was made when the game was first shown that this was going to be Skyrim, but Zelda. And actually, I do kind of think it's probably going to be like some sort of Elder Scrolls game crossed with Zelda. There's a, the game's got its own world built within it with its own sort of logic. You know, like, so there was a bit where I needed to get across a, cat, a little bit of a bridge and I couldn't get over there with climbing because it just ran out of stamina. So what I did is I used, I, I set fire to the grass at the bottom of the canyon mm-hmm. and then I jumped over it using the little hang glider thing you get and the updraft of the heat of the fire uh-huh. managed to take me over. Really? You know? That's and awesome. the guy always said, that's really cool, but other really things you cool. could have, I could have done is I could have chopped down a tree and then rolled the log to the tree down so it covered both sides of it and then walked across that and then you had to keep your balance using the, the, uh, the motion controls to make sure he doesn't fall off. It's, it's things like, like shooting a boar with fire arrows will cook the meat that he, you can then get, which then heals you more. Like, it's got its own <laughs> logic inside, and I really love that. You know, you, I got shot at with uh, Bokoblins with arrows, and it went in the shield I had at the time. And I'd run out of arrows in my own bow now. And when I tried to use my bow, just on accident, Link pulled the arrow in his shield, oh, out of wow. his shield, and put it in his sheath and then fired it back. <laughs> I, he was picking arrows off the floor as they were firing at them to then return fire. It's things like that that kept blowing my mind, and I was like, "Oh my god, oh my god!" It's just, it's, it's, it's going to be fantastic. It really is. I, I can't explain to you. Just, it, you feel like you're free just to do whatever you want. I, I think that's why it's called the Breath of the Wild. It feels like you are sort of just exploring the wild on the breath of the wind, and it, it, it <laughs> feels 
amazing really does and that's just by playing it for 45 minutes <laughs> and I, I think i actually read your um you had a little write-up uh on a website um about your impressions of this game. And one of the things that kind of struck me that I was interested to ask you about is um, you mentioned that you had some trouble defeating a group of three enemies. Um, yes. Which I think there's a tendency, especially in newer Zelda games, to kind of like just be able, especially later in the game, you just get really good at it. And you can just mow down enemies <laughs> without a thought. Um, so I'm intrigued by this idea that actually each encounter becomes a bit of a challenge. Can you talk a little bit about you know, how the combat felt in this game? So I, I fought a couple of enemies. Uh, most of them were just bokoblins. Bu- uh, uh, with with bows and arrows or wear different weapons um but so you only had three hearts in the demo and i took a hit off an arrow and took a whole heart of damage which is un- unusual for zelda because normally they're, they're quite lenient when you take like damage from projectiles that kind of shocked me and then i got one hit by the guy with the, the this club and i died and i was like wow I, I can't believe that that just happened you know mm-hmm. this is a demo and they're supposed to be quite accessible so I had to really go in, and obviously Z-targeting, or well, just targeting as it's called, is back. Mm-hmm. And, and I tried using that, but the problem there was, because there was multiple enemies, it kind of tunnel-visioned me to one enemy. Mm-hmm. And, and like previous Zelda games, where they're like, oh, you've targeted this enemy, you'll engage with just them, yeah, and the others the, the will others stand back. Wait, yeah. The, yeah, the others just started swarming me. I, I, couldn't, huh. I had to sort of run away, and I had to sort of do hit-and-run tactics. And this was just like three standard enemies, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, on their own, on a 1v1 fight, I was destroying them. But mm-hmm. when it was just a couple... You know, it took it took planning. I had to really plan what I was doing. In the end, I I, I died again, and I ended up picking up a a bomb barrel and just dropping it into the hideout and just bang. And even that didn't work because mm. one of the the big boss guy lived and came out and minced me. So in the end, mm. I, I I waited until it was uh, nighttime in the game, and I and as I said in the review, I went in and snuck in and stole all their weapons. Mm. So and then then woke them up, and then when they woke up, they couldn't get their weapons, so they started pelting rocks at me instead. <laughs> Wow, these guys just don't give up. So I like the fact there are, there are ways of avoiding and approaching encounters because there's stealth mechanics in the game as well. Like you have a um, a little thing on your HUD that shows you how loud you're being at any one time, mm-hmm. uh, as as well as a, a hot and cold meter showing how Link's temperature is. Like too hot and you'll start taking damage. Too cold and your stamina just depletes and you can't move as fast. You mm-hmm. know things like that. Uh, they're taken into account and it's just there's so much going on at any one time. It's it, it's it's crazy, you know. Weapons have durability now. My sh- my sword broke halfway through a fight, and I literally was just there, and I like had to run away because I had to pick up a stick and start hitting them with a stick mm-hmm. because I had no sword left anymore. You know, my bowstring snapped randomly. It's like, oh no, I can't use arrows anymore. So I had to go and forage a, a piece of string. It is a lot going on that requires you to rethink about how you engage scenarios, and it rewards you adequately for them. You know, they they realize when things are bad because when I did eventually beat them. I had these bomb arrows, but no bow. Mm-hmm. It gave me this, like, 14-strength bow called a soldier's bow, and it looked amazing, and it was firing off these bomb arrows, and I was one-shotting everything else in the demo. But it was like, I had to make, have that effort to initially get that, mm-hmm. which I really like. Um, I feel like when you eventually do get items in dungeons, there might be, like, a higher uh, durability rating on them. So when you get the boomerang or the bow, mm-hmm. they'll probably have a higher attack damage, but, like, you know, uh, repairable ability because mm-hmm. you know there's no hearts in the game anymore they've said this now you don't randomly get hearts you have to eat food right to recover mm. health you know and um so you have to manage food supplies in your inventory and mm. equip different clothes because you know you, you you know i run around in my in my haste i ignore chests so i had link basically running around in his pants the whole demo because i was just <laughs> trying to get through I, mean, I didn't want to waste time but then when i eventually got when i died one time i was back at the starting area so i just went back in and quickly grabbed you know this this basic tunic uh, and just threw it on, and it gave me a defense boost, which was really cool. And it, so there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff there. It's, it, it's, I can't. It was, and this was just in a plateau, a, a, a small, as they put it in vertical, a small area of the game. And it's just, oh, I just was like, oh my god, when this game comes out, my life is gone. Like if you, if, you, if anyone listening, if anyone listening, like poured hundreds of hours into Skyrim, and you know a lot, and, and got bored of it, because I know a lot of my friends poured hundreds, hundreds of hours into Skyrim. And didn't really feel like they got anything from it. I feel like this game's going to hit the point just there, where if you put that time and effort into it, into Skyrim levels, you will get a lot out of it, and then you can sort of draw a line and go, "Okay, I've completed this game." Mm. Rather than Skyrim seeming infinite, this game will be have lots of stuff to do, but there will be an end goal, and and I like that because that's Nintendo's sort of way with games anyway. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, this was just forty-five minutes. I remember putting it down 
and just thinking to myself, Jesus Christ, this is going to sell this console by itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's how good this game is. It just is. And I came out with like this, this like starry glow in my eyes. And <laughs> I just, I just saw one of the one of the guys who I know from Nintendo go. He looks at me and go, "You just played the Breath of the Wild demo, didn't you?" And I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that look is a that's a common look coming out of that area. I'll tell you that right now." <laughs> that's awesome. Wow. Yeah, that is a game that I've, I've been really looking forward to. So that that makes me yeah. feel good that it it sounds like it's uh, definitely worth it and yet from what i just heard you say basically any kind of standard normal controller would have worked for that game so what's so special about the switch in terms of the hardware and other games that are coming out that make makes me want to go buy this game because 350 dollars 360 dollars for the new zelda that's a little steep Mm. Well, he did say arms earlier. That oh, yeah, yeah. Motion. Yeah. But, and, okay, and that's, so that's, that's cute and all, but um, what, what I'm saying is where's the, where's the rest of the meat in the system? So here's the, here's the thing that's, that I, was another thing that concerned me. Um, the Joy-Con controller, uh, to buy a new one, we got told over here in the UK to buy a new Joy-Con controller, so that's the two uh, Joy controllers and the little attachment to make right, them right. the controller, would cost £75. I think for you guys it's like 80 maybe yeah. $90. Yeah, yeah, it sounds about right. Um, instantaneously as you would expect everyone went bloody hell that's a large price you know that's a sizable chunk now is, here. is that for a single joy con or is that for a pair of joy con no, that's for two joy cons and then the little attachment which makes them so the controllers, two controllers them depending it. on which game you're playing mm-hmm. yeah so everyone went that seems really really expensive but when i actually got there and and you sort of realize what's going on with these little joy cons Suddenly, you, you kind of see where they're coming from. Because if you think about it, Wiimotes, when they came out, were like 30 quid, 30 pounds for me here. So maybe like $40 for about you About $40, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you think about it, the Joy-Cons are essentially two Wiimotes and a peripheral together. So that's mm-hmm. so assume a, a Joy-Con itself is like $40. Mm-hmm. Times it by two, and then you whack a peripheral on there, maybe like maybe $10, $15. Mm-hmm. You're looking at something like, that's worth 95 to to $100 anyway. Right. And then you've got this. And the Joy-Con, I swear to you, puts the Wiimote and the Wii Motion Plus to shame. Which is interesting so, to me because when I first heard about the Switch, it almost sounded to me like, okay, Nintendo's kind of given up on motion controls. They're kind of like, okay, we've had our fun with this, but it's not the thing that's appealing to people anymore. So we're going to just buckle down and like we're going to make the portability the thing. And then when I found out during that presentation, they're like, no, the Joy-Cons have like you know the, the motion controls, yeah. the HD feedback, all this different stuff. Um, it's like, well, they're, they're doubling down on the motion. They're not yeah. getting rid of it. They're, yeah. Well, more than that, it, it actually senses stuff in front of it um, without the bar or any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. That was the little IR way. camera thing. Yeah. So it, it's kind of like, um, well, you remember Connect. Mm-hmm. It didn't, didn't do great, but, um, you know, it was a step. It's almost like the, every one of those little Wiimotes, or uh, I guess I should call them Joy-Cons, has a, a built-in Connect as well. Short range. In a sense. And probably not quite as... Um, I would imagine it's not quite as uh, what's what I'm looking for granular, powerful. Yeah, not, not probably not as powerful. Probably not as accurate as the Connect. Well, the Connect never was that see, accurate. Mm-hmm. Sadly, see, the thing Fair. is, right? Its resolution so, was low. Mm-hmm. I had doubts in the Joy Cons myself, but that's where the One Two Switch game came in. So the One Two Switch oh, the sadly game. isn't being bundled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I actually did play that with my wife. That was oh, really yeah. awkward. <laughs> anyway, moving on from that because I'm getting bad memories, guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, the milk so, like, seems like a mistake. That's <laughs> yeah. Hey, the, that was the, the one game. to switch is the game that really should have been paired with the the Switch. Really, mm. like like how Wii Sports was paired with the Wii, so you could kind of get how to play the Wii, right. and how Nintendo Land was paired with the Wii U, so you kind of got how to use the um, the the tablet and everything. The one to switch. Re- I mean, I, do you know? Even if they announced a bundle right now. Because of the switch for us over here is uh, two hundred eighty pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, if they said three hundred, three hundred and twenty quid for uh, uh, one two switch and the switch itself, I would say yes to that because the game, while not being like a massively impressive game, does a fantastic job of just showing you how like cool these Joy Cons are. The game that sticks out to me is a game literally just called Ball Hunt. And all it is, is what you do is, so you and, and another player hold one Joy-Con on your hand, so you calibrate it by holding it up mm-hmm. in your hand. And then what it does is it uses the, the HD rumble, or and what they're calling haptic feedback, to simulate the feeling of you holding a box in your hand, and in this box, there are X amount of marbles, and you have to move your hand around. I'm doing it in the camera to the guys so they can sort of see. <laughs> yeah. Move your hand around like this, and then you see a box on the screen mirroring your movements, mm. And you can, I swear to you, you can feel these balls 
and these marbles rolling across your hand as if they were actually in your hand. Huh, really? And I was I was shocked. Like yeah. I was genuinely shocked. Cause the aim of the game is to use the analog stick on the on your Joy-Con to select how many uh, marbles you think's in the box and then press A and then when you do that your opponent does the same and then the game goes there was this many. Congratulations, you won, you lost, you drew. And I, and I could genuinely feel three marbles rolling across my hand <laughs> as I was moving it around in my hand. Like I was just wow. moving it like this and I could feel them and I was astounded. And so you would say I could then feel them the... knocking into each other. I could feel them hitting the sides. It was it was it blew my mind. That's pretty right crazy. there, and I was like, "Whoa!" So, so you would say then that the uh, during the presentation they showed the the glass with the ice cubes in the water. That wasn't just them kind of like, yeah, oh no. yeah, you can you can feel this and like you know it's like playing it up. It's like that's actually no, how I. It's exactly it is. like that. Huh. I, I, I wrote that in my review. I said we laughed when he was going, "Oh look, let's see how much ice is in my drink." But you could feel it. Like when when the when we'd done the game over because I was doing it against a Nintendo uh, a Nintendo rep- representative. I actually said to her, do you mind if I just quickly hold both of them? She went, yeah, sure. And I started just shaking them in my hands and just moving them around like maracas. Mm-hmm. And you could feel them. I could feel them in both of my hands. And it was like, it was blowing my mind. I was like, what the hell? I can actually feel these marbles in my hand, in these imaginary box. And then I went to play uh, um, uh, the Wipeout slash F-Zero game. I, I've forgotten its name completely. And, and, and it was there as well when I when I when I skidded into a wall, I could feel it rising up my hands as if I was like skidding up against the wall. When I played Mario Kart and I got hit from behind by a shell, it rumbled up my hand, and I could feel like I it felt like my hand actually went like oomph, and I felt like I'd taken a hit. Huh. And it was so, it, it was just, it was wonderful. Like I was like, this is so nice to to have in my hand, and it feels really nice with this rumble stuff and. Not to mention, like you said, it's got all this cool stuff going on, which doesn't require a sensor bar anymore. Mm-hmm. It, I was just shocked. And then I, as I left, I sort of was thinking about it. I was like, I can see now why these things are as expensive as there are, because they may not look like anything special. But good Lord, there's a lot of stuff going on there. There's a lot of tech it's like really happening there, which hardware. is really good. So on- In fact, that was, that was one of my criticisms of the Switch. The whole thing is so light. And so, like, un, un, like, un, not, not, um, not bad looking is the wrong word. It looks so sleek and so light. Mm-hmm. You think it's cheap. <laughs> like you think to yourself, like, oh, my God, this is a cheap piece of tech. But there's so much going on there. It's crazy. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. So with that in mind, like, just how much those Joy-Cons can do, what sort of game? I mean, because one two switch is basically, it's kind of like a tech demo, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's giving you all these ideas of things that you can use this tech for. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. What would you see do you think could be like this is the game that defines the system because for me for example something like the wii u um the closest they came to that i would say would be something like mario maker because you could actually yeah. use the tablet and and create levels and it felt like you're really getting the most bang from your buck in terms of the system but and it's a fully realized game it's not just a demo like wii sports or, mm-hmm. or nintendo and, land and my, my personal opinion is the nintendo land i mean granted you know it's not the full game like mario maker nintendo but, land is a tech demo but it's like but, I, Switch, but it, as a tech demo i think it did a really great job of demonstrating especially one of the things that i was really excited about with the wii u right which is asymmetric gameplay which i realized i mentioned on a previous podcast and accidentally said um asynchronous yes that that was that was a misspeak I meant to say uh, asymmetrical. No, and, and, and you're but, right. It mm-hmm. was it was very good when it comes to mm-hmm. to demo, and that's what I'm saying. That's what one two switch is. It's 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 doing a good job at demoing what you can do. Mm-hmm. But but really, my question is for a meteor experience because mm-hmm. I don't think anyone's going to say that Nintendo Land or Wii Sports were meaty experiences. <laughs> for like a meaty experience of a game, like like a full fully realized, fully fleshed out game, but that still uses that tech. To, to you know the best of its ability, mm-hmm. what sort of what sort of game would that look like, or do you think that's what Mario Odyssey is going to be? Well, I mean, Mario Odyssey was the biggest shame because it was supposed to be playable at the event, but there was an issue, so no no events around the world had it available, oh, wow. which kind of sucked. Mm. Um, but that's interesting. I, I've, this is the thing because I've had a thought about this. I've had a, I had a couple of thoughts about it, and I had a really long think. And honestly, my answer really is I don't know. Mm. And, and it's, this is the thing because this is the this is what's interesting about the Switch is that we've we've never had a hybrid console before. We've never had a console that you could legitimately say, okay, I can leave this in my house forever and just play as a console and not ever use the the hybrid feature. Mm-hmm. But then at the same time, you can say, well, I don't own a TV and live in a small flat. I can use this mm-hmm. as a my own TV and you know as a console and I can take it on the go. Uh, we've never had this experience before, and it's going to require a new way of thinking a new style of design where people sit down and go right can we potentially utilize the handheldness of this console can we utilize the fact that you don't need a tv to play these games Mm -hmm. 
you know one of the games there is quite simply a cowboy game so you know you you, you know the switch itself goes three two one shoot and you stand at the side and you have to pull up your, your joy con like a gun and go pew, and press a button to fire and, and the game actively says to you look at your opponent mm-hmm. do not look at the screen right mm-hmm. so it's encouraging you to already look away and it, it's already got this sort of stuff sneaking up on it i think that when the switch sort of comes in I think they needed to start with the big titles. They needed to go, here's Splatoon, mm-hmm. here's Mario Kart, here's Zelda, here's Mario, you know, here's a new Sonic game. Mm-hmm. You know, they're getting these, the, 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 the familiarities there. Right. They're getting the brands that people trust. And then when, when and if the Switch comes in and it solidifies itself as something that people will want to buy, that's when devs will start going, we can mess around with this now. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, they've announced, uh, Game Freak, for example, have announced they are making a Pokemon game for this console. And Game Freak have always been about that handheld life you know they've they've been always like you know we want you to take this thing around with you and they're always taking weird risks with their games uh they add a new feature into pokemon every year which you tends to utilize the console that it's on whether it's the 3d feature the recording feature so some a game like that that has the familiarity and the power to just suddenly turn around and go and then here's a weird little gimmicky thing for this console you know we might find that you could hold pokeballs in your hand in vertical by using joy cons mm-hmm. you could you know move your pokemon or something like that and, and and then take it on the go we might find that that starts to happen but in terms of what they could do with it it at the minute it's hard to see because mm-hmm. like i said we've never had anything like this so i've got nothing really to sort of even remotely compare it to or even like give an analogy it's so fresh and so interesting i think we're gonna have to look towards the third party developers on this one because they've got i think they said mm. 80 to 100 third party development games in development for for this year and the start of next year which is a big nice big number mm-hmm. yeah it is so hopefully one of them will produce something which we can sort of go wow that's a cool use of that and i i think this is something that nintendo has has struggled with for a while when they come up with and this happened with the wii and the wii u um and the 3DS to an extent, but they come up with these sort of very creative ideas in terms of um, what the game system can do. But a lot of the third-party devs don't really don't really seem willing to actually mm. try to use it to its full potential. Yeah, they just kind of stick to the tried and true. Right. So then it's really just Nintendo that'll kind of try to do something that that you know pushes the envelope, and everyone else yeah. kind of just does the bare minimum cash in if they do anything at all. So I am encouraged that there are a lot of um, third-party developers that are already signed on for the Switch. And hopefully if people are very excited um, and it does have a big user base, we will actually see some of those experimental titles coming out on the Switch because I know that there's plenty of of smaller developers or um, sort of offshoot teams within a larger developing house that would love to work on something, you know, outside of the box, different sort of game, try to experiment and get a name for themselves, producing something that, you know, isn't just their version of Mario or their version of Assassin's Creed or what have you, these big series. It's funny you should mention that because I had a chat with a couple of the third-party devs that were there. So we obviously had a couple of guys from Sega with Mm. Sonic Mania. Uh, We had a couple of guys from Ubisoft with Just Dance, which, by the way, was really, really fun with the responsiveness of uh, the Joy-Cons. Um, but there was another game there called Has Been Heroes, and it was from an independent developers in, I believe they said Sweden? Yeah, Sweden. Um, yeah, Sweden. And I, I was just talking to them about it. I said, you know, uh, have you, you know, how long have you been devving? What kind of games have you made? And, and I said, and I asked them, you know, wh- why the Switch? And they said, oh, it's just, we were really interested in it. It was a really cool piece of tech we could work with. It was nowhere near as complex as the Wii U specifications was. Mm-hmm. Nintendo approached us and literally just said, look, you know, Here's a couple of things you could do. You know, it could have some touchscreen functionality put in there as well. Because, you know, everyone gets this has got a multi-touchscreen as well. Oh, wow. I forgot about exactly, that. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so it's like, a, it's like a proper tablet. You know, this is a real multi-touch tablet uh, with, a, with a fantastic screen, screen? screen quality. <laughs> pardon me. With a fantastic screen quality, which, which shocked me, you know. And the instantaneousness, you know, when I was playing them, uh, uh, Has Been Heroes, it was up on the screen. I asked the guys, look, can I, can I, you know, can I pull it out? You know, can I pull it out of this, this slot? And I went, okay. And they went, yeah. So I slotted the Joy-Cons in and pulled it out. And I counted to two. And it had gone from the screen to my now tablet. And there was no drops. There's no frame drops. There was, I, it didn't feel like it was any less FPS at all. Even if it was, I couldn't tell. And it still was a fantastically pretty, pretty, 
Oh God, I've lost the ability to speak. A pretty <laughs> picture, still, and it's it just crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So, Can I also just say, sorry, I forgot to mention this before. Yes. Uh, when you have the the tablet in your hand with the Joy-Con controller slotted in the side, it weighs about the same, or maybe just slightly less than what the current Wii tab Wii U tablet okay. is in oh, terms really? of weight. It felt so yeah. light because I played the entirety of Splatoon with the uh, with the console and the gyro controls as a tablet, so mm. I was moving it around. Like a like a giant PSP almost, mm-hmm. hmm. and um, and I thought my arms would get tired, or I thought that my hands would cramp, but I didn't have that. And I was I, I put it down. And I felt like this thing. How is this thing doing what it's doing when it's this light and this compact? I just don't get it. It's like they've made some deal with some sort of witch. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> it, it it really really is like because because the thing is as well. I said to one of the, the Nintendo reps, it's it's not even that bad looking. It's very sleek, you know. Mm-hmm. When you have the base tablet in your hand, it's the sort of thing. Like I wrote my my exact analogy I used in the review was it looks like the t- sort of tablet you'd see like some sort of businessman on a train pull out to send a memo and then put away. Yeah. You know, it's got that kind of sleek kind of nice product appeal to it. Mm. You know, it's got the headphone jack and the extra USB slot, uh, USB slots, and it's got like a, a way for a micro SD to go in to give it more memory. And and it, it just it suddenly when you when you put all this together, you know, you realize it's a tablet with it's going to have its own interface. It's going to be able to connect to your other smartphone devices to do other things. It's going to have its own apps mm-hmm. which you can develop for. It's and you, you know you slot the controls inside. It's got a stand so you can make it like a television screen. And then, you know, put the controls in a different thing and then play that, play your games like that. Suddenly, when you say it's like, how much is it in dollars for you guys over there? It's like 300 300 yeah, three hundred dollars. Yeah. When you say th- this product is three hundred dollars, suddenly that doesn't seem like a bad price. No, no. Suddenly at all. you think that is. But the thing is, it's exactly the right price. Like I left and I said to myself, "What would I put if if if, if I didn't know the price? What would I put on that?" And I said three hundred quid, three hundred pounds. Mm. And for us, it's two hundred and eighty pounds. Mm. And I said, "So I wrote, and I think it is just about worth it mm-hmm. as a piece of tech. Games withstanding for a second it is just about worth it." And the games they've got coming out for it are, I would say, of good enough quality and tick enough boxes to make it feel worthwhile. Because they, they also announced at the event, they've got a new approach to software. That instead of actually releasing software in popular high peak times, their plan is to release software throughout the year on monthly basis. So instead of just going, you know, because we, we go through months over the summer where they just don't release games. Right. Like yeah, no company that's very games. common. But they've said that what they're actually going to do now is they're going to release actual, genuinely good first-party titles. So they're going to have a first-party title and then a wave of third-party games beneath it. So mm-hmm. like they're going to release them on a bi-monthly or monthly basis. So that's why all the games are structured like they are. Like Arms is coming out in April. So you've got Breath of the Wild in Mar- Mar- uh, March, mm-hmm. Arms in April, Sonic Mania in May... And all these big titles, like, one by one, and then they're followed by, like, four or five other small third-party developer games or third-party add-on games. Well, that's good and that's the new policy. I remember a big problem with the Wii U, especially, was really big gaps where there was, like, nothing worthwhile coming out. Yeah. yeah. And they, they want it to try and become a standard. So they're probably going to save the big stuff for, like, Christmas. Like, Mario Odyssey, mm-hmm. Odyssey, I think, is coming out near the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And that, that that's for obvious reasons. You know, they're not stupid. They've got to make mm-hmm. money, and they've got to get that Christmas. And then I bet you only one of their bundles going to come out with Mario Odyssey and the Switch Oh, I bet Christmas. you anyway that's going to be the – they're aiming for that to be their hot Christmas item. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, and, year, and credit guaranteed. to them. Yeah. But if they're going to give it the rest of the year and they're going to give us good content throughout the whole year – Suddenly, you don't have a console where you go, you know, because the Wii U, faults aside, had some really, really good games on it. Yeah, it did. Mm -hmm. But it came out, as you mentioned, so far apart and so few in between. It gathered dust and then you had to go, you know, (laughs) blow it all off and (laughs) load it in so I can play Bayonetta 2, you know. But but I feel like the plan is that they want to make this a, a console that you will continuously play, be playing at least for a little bit. This is what I like about Nintendo. They've kind of realised they are the th- they are the they are the other option. Mm. You know, you've got the two, you've got PS4 and Xbox One like smashing their heads together to try and be the standard home console. Mm-hmm. And Nintendo have literally thrown their hands up, going, "No, look, we're not even going to be on that race. We are when you tick other in a survey. That is us now. <laughs> you know, if 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 our product suits you in any such way, and you can have us." We are here for you, and we are going to be of that quality that we will tick that box. For example, my wife lives in a flat in London, and she doesn't have room in her room to have a TV, let alone a console. 
And this console, the Switch, would be perfect for her. It has simplistic and yet just enjoyable games mm-hmm. on it with a with an interface which interfaces with other smart devices such as your tablet or your phone. And it has its own inbuilt screen, which is is light and very, very good quality. It's like perfect for her. Mm-hmm. It's literally the perfect console for, for that scenario. But, you know, obviously when you're a student or you're a young kid and you can, you know, you've got the whole house to play and you've got HD TV and you know, suddenly, you know, it doesn't fit you that much, but you can kind of be like, oh, well, it, I, I, a cool tablet, that's that's pretty sweet, and I can take this thing with me on the go, you know, the, it's suddenly got other things that that specific person can utilise, and that's kind of where this console excels in my mind. It's like, it is the other option, and it's not a bad other option. It's normally the other's like, oh, I'll, I'll take the booby prize, but this isn't a booby prize, it's actually not a bad product. Which is great, and I, I think if Nintendo stick to that and really sort of go on the fact that you know we're not going to get everyone, but we can at least make it accessible for everyone. So if they do want to get it, then they don't feel bad about having to be forced to pick the lesser quote unquote option, which is awesome. Yeah. It feels like Nintendo with the Switch have gone. What made the Wii what the Wii was? Okay, take that. Now let's take the almost too quick innovation we had with the Wii U. So the methodology behind the Wii U. And take that. And now let's take the ideology of Nintendo. Smash it all together. Crunch it together. And then what do you get? And the Switch is the, the baby that came from this. You know, it's you can sort of see elements from all their previous attempts of consoles in this product. You can see it. You can see the the, the, the weird niche area of the of the, the GameCube. You can see the gimmicks of the Wii. You can see what the Wii U wanted to do. And I feel like the this console is basically them saying we've learnt from our mistakes. You know, we don't have a gimmick. You can just make a game and put it on our console. Yes, it won't be the most graphically superior game you've ever made, but you can develop for it and potentially, to make up for your lack of graphical capability, innovate, Mm -hmm. you know? Because I genuinely do believe, and this is a completely personal view, but I I do believe that if if Nintendo were to drop off and not make uh, consoles anymore the whole of our industry would just stagnate to the point of where we would be getting absolutely nothing good. Because if we're being brutally, brutally honest, and bear in mind, I own a PlayStation 4 and an Xbox One, yeah. mm-hmm. I don't see the bloody difference between these two consoles anymore other than exclusives. Yeah. They so both yeah, have the same-ish sort of stuff, Control the same-ish shape. sort of games, the same-ish sort of extra stuff like Netflix or whatever on them, and they're just in, they're interchangeable. They're the same console, just a different company behind it. How can you innovate when you're basically fighting over the same thing it doesn't make much sense to me the the industry needs nintendo to be the crazy kid in the corner playing with the science kit (laughs) (laughs) causing explosions because if that wasn't there then the other people wouldn't feel you know the other people just rely on normality and that would suck Mm. we would get experiences which are terrible you know and the the industry would just be ubisoft (laughs) <laughs> where, every, where every you know, game is yeah, the that, same I, thing pumped out all, yeah. every time over and over again. Each game has repeated <laughs> elements within it, Jim. <laughs> but you know you what I mean, yourself. guys? It's like it's like we want we love the games. That's why we do what we do, and yeah. we want the industry to keep expanding and innovating and creating new and exciting experiences for players around the world. And I feel like the Switch will give us some experiences. You know, I, we can be touched by games. Like I, I played Final Fantasy XV recently. Mm. I thoroughly enjoyed that game because the narrative behind it and the the character developed like development of the story and really hit me you know and i really loved it and i was i was thankful for that experience being on that console but then i thought to myself you know this i could have been playing this on xbox one and i would have the exact same feelings yeah but then again i can play you know uh bayonetta or pikmin and another game and get experiences that i could never imagine to get uh from the other consoles on them you know we need nintendo to be there to be this force because they, they, they're dangerous they're a wild card <laughs> no one because the wii was the biggest trojan horse ever the wii came in and went oh motion controls ooh, and everyone went ah uh, and then suddenly motion controls blew up mm-hmm. and the other companies went oh my god we don't have anything to match that and nintendo just went straight to the bank it's true you know, yeah. they were like well we will just we will just dump a wii, a wii in every single uh house in the country and win this console war with with a with a 100 percent Worst console With a <laughs> in every way. Console. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. It's, it's 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 it was a worst console in every single way. But they 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 won that whole generation without much effort. They mm-hmm. just put a Wii with Wii Sports in a house, and boom, they are the one that everyone remembers. You know, you can't sleep on the underdog, so to speak. Yeah.
like kind of revisiting that idea of one two switch. Um, when I heard about that, I was fascinated by this idea of a game, a video game that you play without looking at the screen. Um, and this one specifically is a party game. You're looking at your opponent, and they've sort of set up the ways in which, like, you know, you use the touch or the, the HD rumble and that sort of stuff. Um, and looking at your opponent's about timing, it's about listening for things. Um, the the obvious reaction, or I think the immediate reaction a lot of us are going to have to that sort of thing is it's a gimmick that might be kind of cool in one game or two. Uh, it's good for a couple of parties, but then after that, it's not going to go anywhere. So my question would be. Like if if there's sort of it, let's assume that we are going to explore this new genre of the the screenless video game, um, where well, do we think like what do we think might be able to be done with that? I, I think right off the bat, if it's a screenless video game or you're not looking at the screen, it's not a video game. It's a game. Yeah. There's no video component there. True, so true. already we're sort of shifting our our perspective. It's of, still a computer of, game, though, Joe. Oh, I'm not saying it's not a game. <laughs> I'm just saying it's not a video in mm-hmm. terms of if, if there's no video, video component to it. Video is very specifically visual. Right, visual. That's what you mean. So if there's no video component. Now there's audio. Mm-hmm. There's also the um the, the, that sort of haptic feedback that uh, Bradley was talking about, mm-hmm. uh, which is interesting as well. So you have these different elements and different ways to interact with it that. Um, other games don't really have. I mean, we have, of course, we've had Rumble for a while. Right. But Rumble is not the same thing as what you were describing um, no. with the way that you're feeling the, you know, feeling these objects um, in a much more um, refined way. So it allows for different experiences. Rumble is just this brute force kind of feedback thing that doesn't really link any, to anything specific. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think in this sense, it's almost like this auditory and, um, you know, haptic experience. So it's that, laser tech. Yeah, it's it, it's yeah, laser tech. Okay, uh, but I could but, I could honestly see like a D and D setting with this. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like you you sort of have the, the 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 GM or DM whatever you want to call him uh, sitting there with the switch in front of them, and everyone in the room maybe having a Joy Con in some way, and it, that be their weapon. Mm-hmm. So you can have some feedback there. So you don't you don't necessarily use the console. You use the console for an addition to your game. You know, uh, your sound effects, uh, monsters, visual identification of where you are in the dungeon you know i i, I postulated this stuff when the wii u came out because i was mm-hmm. like oh you know think of what you could do with it that that and then they never really utilized right. it um but this might be the first one they could do that with because i forgot to mention to you guys actually this is something really important on this front it has ad hoc connectability right. so you can connect switches to switches mm-hmm. so you can for example you can play splatoon on a local multiplayer thing now for example mm-hmm. Like, I can see people, for example, like, you know, we used to have parties where people would come together, and maybe they'd bring their extra controller from the Wii U, and we'd all play Mario Kart 8. But now yeah. people can literally bring their Switch with them. And we can yes, have, exactly, like, yeah. eight Switches in the same room all playing Mario Kart together with their own screen, which is kind of like the, the, the dream of the Wii U that never really got realized. And yeah. now it really is. Mm-hmm. And to me, it kind of it reminds me a little bit of being able to, like, bring your 3DS together and do stuff. But nobody, not everyone had a 3DS or had the same games. I feel like the, the Switch it might be the first time in a very long while that we have people who, like, could potentially all have the platform and all have the same games and come together yeah. for that local multiplayer. It is, it is, a, it is an interesting thing to, to talk about, this sort of stuff. Like, but the, I, 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 I don't know about you guys, but I really... It's so hard for me to think of like a gameplay experience for this unless I really sat down and genuinely thought about so it. So are you telling me you can't just develop a brilliant game within a couple of minutes here? What's I can't make a triple A game in like you. a minute? Oh. But this is the thing though. I I mean I went to this event a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. and I have been thinking about it like on and off, you know, among work and other things. But and I I just every single time I come up with an idea, I just think to myself, no, that that's kind of not really utilizing it properly. It's just taking a gimmick side of it and then making a game. Mm-hmm. I can't see anything and and at the minute and that's not to say there isn't. I'm pretty sure we're going to start seeing them, but mm-hmm. I think it will take someone to do something interesting with it. Like so, a developer somewhere a third party developer or even Nintendo themselves mm. will produce a game which uses the everything we've just talked about so mm. you utilize the HD or utilize the as, uh, asymmetric gameplay um, it will utilize all of this and suddenly it will click you know we'll, everyone will have that eureka moment where it will make sense mm. and even if the game isn't like super well received or massively popular someone another developer someone will go oh that game did that and that was really good Let's see if we can take that and improve that. And then suddenly it will 
blow up kind of like kind of like the Wii did like yeah. the Wii you know it started off with Mario Tennis and all that you know in Wii Play and people took those concepts and those ideas and split off and made games and inter- uh, implemented into their games throughout the entirety of the Wii span until all the, all the shovelware started coming in by like you know 10 tons a minute but um, I feel like yeah, that's what's going to happen. Yeah, thank you, Carnival Games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, good God. Um, but you, do, do you know what I mean? It, it's going to take someone who's really sort of... Um, and people have known about this. I think uh, I, I probed my guy who works in, in Nintendo, and he said that they've, uh, they've known about... Like, developers have known about this for, I think, two years mm. minimum, I believe he said. that. Mm-hmm. The, 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 so they've known about this stuff for a while. So they've had, like, a lot... They've had teams working on these games for a long, long time um uh, with the so, vague idea of the specs so, one so of, sorry I, well, one of the things that i'm thinking of um because i know you you talked about how much more precise the the motion um is in these joy cons and so i was thinking of something a game that i recall playing um that was actually ported to the wii um i don't think quite as successful as it could have been but um have you played okami yes and so you, yes you have that oh, element Lord, yes. of um you know drawing or painting symbols in order to um you know gain power yeah. and that kind of thing and i was wondering if if maybe that's an element that they could do not necessarily okami but instead of just having this mixture of you know an action adventure game and then you also can do some drawing what if you know the whole the whole aspect of drawing these symbols was the entire gameplay so mm. like take something like uh, this is sort of an anime mm. trope but like the um you know the demon slayers or whatever an anime where they would dr- they would write symbols mm-hmm. to lock demons or monsters or something on little cards mm-hmm. and they would put the card on the forehead or on a do- on of the enemy to banish it or on a doorway as like a trap or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah, talismans. So, and stuff. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. little talisman thing. So something like that where maybe the whole gameplay is you you kind of drawing symbols mm-hmm. and those symbols do something in the world. Mm-hmm interact with the world in some way i know we're not it's not utilizing every aspect of it Mm -hmm. but if you could actually have it if it it actually could be precise enough to um detect different movements it might be interesting i know it sounds like it could get complex because there's a lot of different things that you could potentially draw but if you think of a game like say um fighting games like street fighter 2 for example there's a ton of 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 interactions and combinations that you learn as a player in order to be successful at that game. Mm. So I don't think that just because, you know, there's different things to draw that it would necessarily be difficult, especially because people are much more adept at writing, at least in modern societies. We're much more adept at writing than we are at, say, um, hitting, you know, ABC and moving the a D-pad mm-hmm. around. I mean, that's not a natural thing. We have to teach ourselves to do that. Mm-hmm. Sure. We don't really have to teach ourselves how to write. We just have to to recognize, okay, this is the symbol that I'm trying to write. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of imagining a couple of things, actually. And mm-hmm. what my inspiration for one of these comes from, um, drawing a blank on the name, was a very experimental game where it was all audio. Um, there was, And you're actually, you specifically, like, but you put on a mask. Is it the under, when you're the, underwater, the underwater and there's, like, yeah. sea creatures? And so you yeah. can't see anything, but you're, you're, hearing, you're hearing stuff, and you have to sort of, like, use the audio mm-hmm. to uh, figure out what's going on around you and try to avoid uh, getting killed, I think it was. Um, so I'm kind of imagining one possibly a game where you're like a blind martial artist of some sort, <laughs> where you you hear what's going on around you and you have forced feedback. Oh, the and blind so, monk. And so you yes. like you you hear someone coming up against you and you like strike at them and you feel the impact when you hit uh, from your from your motion control attacks. So that that could be a cool idea. That that game was um, called Deep Sea, by the way. Deep Sea. That's Deep right. Sea. Um, and then the other idea I had is given the little IR sensor, because they demonstrated, for example, it could tell the difference between throwing rock, paper, and scissors. Um, yes, so what if you, like, had a ninja game where, like, they do, like, all, like, the things with their hands to, like, cast some ability? Oh, like hand symbols and yeah. stuff. Yeah. So you could do that. Or um, kind of an, an implied thing, they never actually stated it, but the UI kind of suggested in Metroid Prime that the way that Samus would change what weapon she's using is changing the shape of her hand inside the, the gun, the cannon. Um, and oh, so yeah. what if you like pointed the control at your hand, made the symbol for what sort of weapon you want to do, and basically use that as your way to switch weapons? Oh, mm. we, we definitely need a new Metroid Prime on Switch. I, oh, yeah. I, I could get yeah, behind that. Yeah. We need a new Metroid full stop, <laughs> really, <laughs> don't we? Like, uh, I mean, Federation Force was not the game you should have put the Metroid Prime tag on. No, <laughs> no, that was unfortunate. But this the Switch does give them another opportunity um, Retro has been working on a game. We talked about it last uh, last week. So mm-hmm. they could potentially be working on a new Metroid Prime, which hopefully would utilize some of these um, extra capabilities of the Switch. And as you recall, my reckless speculation was that it was going to be the exact type of game Bradley's just been talking about, the one that makes it click 
for all of us. Now, that reckless speculation actually ended up in our uh, bonus compatible from last time. So um, if you want to hear that reckless speculation, go to our website and check out the uh, the bonus compatible for bonus. Uh, episode 90. Yeah. The thing is, is like I think we can all agree, um, regardless of people's feelings of the Switch, so whether you think it's trash or whether you think it's super, super good, it is at, at minimum going to change the way people design games and the way they think about them. I mean, just, just the fact that we've you've got two players, like, like two, two yeah. controllers come with it now, that's yeah. going to change our philosophy immensely, just that alone. Exactly, yeah. and these these things, that the, they are good controllers by themselves, you know? I played the entirety of, of a whole race in Mario Kart on, like, hardest difficulty with just one side of the joy controller, so just, like, literally one of them, mm-hmm. and I was doing everything I normally do. I was doing all the power slides, I came in second, and and and, I, and against like a couple other people, and and I was like, I was surprised. This this small little thing, it worked really well. I mean, as a as a, it's, it's got like a attachment you can plug in. It comes with the console. Plug into the other side of it, so it doesn't have the connector slots uh, that it has on for when it slides into the Wii U. So you can put a uh, sorry a switch, and you put it over them, and it makes it more rounded. So mm-hmm. it makes like a more sort of like round controller, just to verify that as well. So it feels really nice down as well. But I don't know. I just. I'm excited to see what people do with this. Yeah. You know, it is a, it is a console now that, that you can develop for without any sort of weird restriction. You can just make a game, and then on top of that, you can add in now a haptic feedback feature. You can add in a motion control feature with, like, really good motion controls. It, it's going to be really exciting to see what people think of and what they want to do with it. Yeah. And that's that's super cool to me. Like, with what's the thing you can innovate on a PS4 now? Well, we can make this character look damn prettier and it's like yeah but we you know oh we okay. can share it you're, you're overlooking the, the, the all important <laughs> share right we, uh, switch has that by the way switch mm. has a share button yeah and it, you press the share button you can share it now like, that's another thing it's added that they didn't make a big deal of because sharing but... is caring yeah <laughs> that's totally what it is. one thing as well they've remained very quiet on is uh the uh, uh features and, and programs and apps you can make for it because they've said it's going to be like a uh, like a like a tablet, it's gonna have its own OS and stuff like that, which can connect to your other uh, tablet slash smartphone devices. Mm-hmm. They've been very quiet on how you can develop apps for that, but they mentioned it and went. They just uh, now moving on. It's like, well, whoa, 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 you mentioned you said you can develop apps for this because they announced there's uh, an app called the Parental Guidance app, mm-hmm. which you download on your phones, and you can connect it to your your Switch, and you can set parental controls mm-hmm. in it. So you can set. Um, so you can't the, play Yandare Simulator. <laughs> yeah, no, you, you can set age restrictions, you can set uh, time of play, so you can say, you know, an alarm will pop up on the screen saying you have 10 minutes left before you should stop playing, and then if your child disobeys it, you can remotely turn the console off, so we're going to standby mode. Mm. You Kids can, are going to love a, that. I know, right? They, they actually did a, fun, they did a funny little video about it where it was uh, Bowser is the parent and Bowser Jr. is the child. Yeah. yeah. And it's like actually they, a really good video, which it shows what you can do. But that that's – and I was looking at it, and everyone was looking at it going, oh, I've parental controls. I was like, that is an app that is connecting with the console. <laughs> that is an app that is connecting with the console, mm-hmm. but just being an app. Yeah. Why is no one realizing the potential this could have? You could have people you know? on their phones, like the, using their phones as their own controllers, potentially with the exactly the, 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 same, what the, the same game is. Yeah. thing is. Think, think of that for is. a D and D element yeah. for a second. Like, we, we talk about D and D. Suddenly, oh look, my whole of my character and everything's on my phone and on my screen, and I'm connecting it via an app to the Switch, which the GM has, and they can do stuff and show you different things and play sounds from your phones. You have a Joy-Con on one hand and a phone in another. It's 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 you see what I mean about the mm-hmm. positive possibilities we have here it's so exciting and every single yep. time i think about this and i'm talking about it, i get really excited like when i talk to my students about it i'm like can you not see the possibilities of development here mm-hmm. things we can slightly put in imagine if you had a game that utilized all of them if for example you have a, a, a game where a character needs to use a phone suddenly you have a smartphone you've got the app for the game to connect to your phone your phone call in the game is coming from your phone <laughs> in real life that's cool same That's game. just, you know, it's yeah. little things like that. Like, ah, oh, do you see what I mean? Like, it's pumped you get, but yeah. it's all because I've played it. It's a hard sell for people oh, who haven't played I, it yet. See, and that right there, uh, your phone ringing in real life from the game, uh, that says that we gotta, we have to get um, Hide- Hideo Kojima <laughs> on the Switch, get him to make something crazy that's going to try to break the fourth wall because that's what he loves doing. I've been waiting mm-hmm. for a Nintendo Kojima, like, uh, collab for I have too, so honestly. Long. Honestly, I think that... <laughs> Because he now has his own studio, um, I wouldn't be surprised if he does end up developing a Switch game. Obviously not for Death Stranding, that's a, that's a totally different project, right. but I do totally think that he could he could get behind a, um, a very weird, offbeat kind of experience, sort of like a little more akin to what he was doing before he, he became 
I'm going to make nothing but Metal Gear Solid guy because that was what Konami wanted him to do. Mm-hmm. So I think he, yeah. he definitely has other ideas in him. He's developed them beforehand. He's done uh, done a few after, uh, during Metal Gear Solid, like, um, was it uh, Zone of the Enders? Mm-hmm. Oh, I love Zone of the Enders. Yeah, so I mean, he's, it's just that it was, it was overshadowed by Metal Gear Solid. So I'd love to yeah. see him do something more experimental. And so basically you're saying that some dude with weird ooze coming out of his nose holding a baby in a jar could text me and be like hey dude you want some of those with, with, with the, with the, with the, the HD yes. with the HD Rumble you can feel the baby inside the capsule oh, 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 we have to, oh he's got to do this now oh yeah. he's got to no you can't let insane people near new tech man this is just, oh no it's true no they already are he's already got Suda51 on board oh yeah, well yeah we gotta, get, we gotta get these two guys together get them together yeah Travis, we got Travis touchdown. He's got his, um, you know, his big, uh, his big light sword. But instead of it being like a, a fake lightsaber, it's actually just a tube of liquid gel that has a baby inside. And then <laughs> oh, you know, just oh combine these two games, and he's got to like shake up the baby in order to get. You got to shake the baby in order to get power. <laughs> oh, my God, oh no. this, is, this could be a fantastic game. Yes. I mean, this we joke, but you know, this there's so much stuff here that people could use. I just. Mm-hmm. I'm excited. I'm so excited, and I just I wanna I wanna see this. I mean, and, I'm, and don't worry, I'll be happy with my Zelda. I'll be happy with Splatoon two. Mm-hmm. I, I thoroughly enjoy Splatoon one. I'll be definitely probably be happy with Mario Odyssey. Just all jokes aside about that game, and I will definitely definitely be happy with the new Sonic game because, as you all know, I'm a massive Sonic Hedgehog fanboy. We're not talking about that. Too much. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it, it it's just the, the possibilities for this console are, are worth me getting it. In general, the other thing that I like about this is that it feels like they're actually marketing it because with the Wii yeah. U, I really felt like it was so poorly marketed that all, most people didn't even realize it was a separate console. Yeah. No, and, and I say, and I, when I say most people, I mean that literally. Most of the install base of the Wii, which included a lot of people that were normally not what you would call a, a traditional gamer, um, they just saw Wii U, almost the exact same name. They saw it was a tablet. They saw that tablet piece and they thought, "Oh, this is just an add-on to my Wii." I don't really need this. They didn't even yeah. know that it was something different. So yeah. now they've got the Switch. Um, they're marketing it aggressively. It has a different name. Um, they're really pushing what it can do that the Wii U can't do or that the Wii couldn't do. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're really trying to get back those they're trying to get back those casual gamers. They're trying to really tap into, those, uh, into millennials and the way that they might game and the way that they also to kind of excite them, like you're excited, in ways that you maybe could game. And plus, they're going to go after the kids with some of the specific game content that they have. And then, you know, old fogies like uh, like me uh, and Doc over here. Um, <laughs> but but we. I love the fact you had to specify, like specifically Doc. <laughs> yeah. Specifically, I, I included myself though. As well. But uh, but yeah, people that have been gaming a while, I don't really cons- I'm consider myself quite at that millennial level. But um, but yeah, I mean, I've been. I'm I'm interested. I'm excited about it because of some of the games that they've shown that that really appeal to me. Um, Breath of the Wild for me is it is the realization of what the original Legend of Zelda was in philosophy. Mm-hmm. Only now it's it's fully realized. It's fully yeah. because before you couldn't do all this stuff when it comes to survivability and uh, the all these different ways to approach the environment. Everything being sort of um, interactable. Which yeah. was was part there were there were elements of that in the original Legend of Zelda and the series kind of moved a little bit away from that as it went on actually, but the very first game had had a lot of those elements and that was a big influence of the of uh, Miyamoto when he first designed the game. So now we're kind of seeing a realization of that vision um, in a very different way because it's a modern system. Yeah, yeah. But I'm very excited to see how it turns out, especially after hearing your impressions. Those so explorer I, elements. Yes, I think. Yeah. yes, and so I do want to thank you for coming on and sharing and getting. Getting me even more disappointed in myself for not pre-ordering it. Time. For pre-ordering it, yeah. Because I'm probably no, I, I'm glad to glad to come on, guys. I really appreciate appreciate you coming on. I always enjoy our, our our discussions on this show. But I, I just I, this is why I was so excited to come on because I really think that this console is going to sell by people playing it mm-hmm. and telling people it's it's good, it's good, it really is good. And I, and I want to get as many people to know this as possible. And, I, and it isn't my my Nintendo fanboyism aside. Um, I have a lot of respect for that company regardless and I trust them to now g- realise their mistakes you know and I feel like based mm-hmm. on what you said yourself what they've been doing with their marketing with mm-hmm. their with their approach to design and their approach to what they're you know doing in terms of how they're sort of like, appealing to people they have learnt their mistakes they've realised you know we, we know people were accused of having drought periods we're not going to have drought periods people were accused of having, having third party we've got third party people were accused us of relying on gimmicks 
his useful gimmicks that aren't really gimmicks. You know, people accuse us of being behind the times. Here's a bloody tablet. You know, <laughs> it's like, right. how more of the times can you be? You know, it wouldn't mm. surprise me if it comes out and they go, by the way, you can download Mario Run on your new Switch because it's an app. Yeah. You know, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. You know, it it were, it's kind of the things you would expect it to, to to do. They drop those just casually, and people spread that by word of mouth, going, "Oh, you know, don't buy a tablet, don't buy the new iPad. You can, you know, it's unless you if you want it to play games or whatever, you can just buy a game console tablet." Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. why why bother? You know, they might impeach on other audiences that they mm-hmm. never even expected to. You know, it's it's. So I have I have a lot of faith in them because of this, and obviously my in, in a Nintendo fanboy is telling me to buy the next Sonic game uh, because if I don't, I will probably you know explode or something. <laughs> well, thank everyone for joining us for episode number ninety one of the Backward Dash Compatible dot com podcast. Our uh, talk about the Switch and uh, the potential that we think that holds. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And I've been Brad. See you guys next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.